double header, literally, and it's a nail biter where both teams are tied in the ninth. We have two big topics to cover today. How do you sell to consumers through retail, catalog, pharma? Very, very tough to navigate. And then you got to worry about regulation on top of all of it. How do you deal with the FDA and get your technology approved? From what I've heard the last couple of days, it's not such an easy task. We are so lucky to have our next speakers here. They have dealt with both of these challenges and have more than succeeded. So let me introduce you to them. Stuart Blitz, Director of Worldwide Commercial Development at Agamatrix. He joined Agamatrix in 2002 as a founding employee, helping to grow the company from a startup to one with 15 plus FDA cleared products, 130 employees, 2 million glucose meters, and 1 billion plus test strips placed in the market worldwide. They developed the world's first hardware medical device that connects to an iPhone. Joe Flaherty, Senior Manager of Strategic Marketing from Agamatrix. He leads the design team. Their products are sold worldwide by Sanofi, Medco, Walgreens, the Apple Store, Walmart, Kroger, Target, and are used by millions of patients around the globe. I'll let you guys take it. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming and listening to us talk today. Uh, as Jill just said, I'm Joe Flaherty, and I head up the design team at Agamatrix, and I've been there for about eight years. And uh, my name is, is my mic on? Yeah. My name is Stuart Blitz, and uh, I've been there for about 10 years, uh, and I direct all the uh, commercial and business development activities at Agamatrix. Um, so we want to, as Joe mentioned, we want to talk about two things today. The first part is talking about selling to consumers uh, in a regulated environment, and the second part is talking about uh, the FDA and other gatekeepers which, uh, and other things to consider uh, when you're selling into a regulated space. Uh, uh, in, in the U.S. and worldwide. So a little bit about uh, our company, Agamatrix, uh, was founded in 2001, uh, actually like founded by uh, Sunny Vu, I think he's here somewhere, and uh, Sridhar Iyengar. Uh, they founded the company uh, over 10 years ago. And uh, we make uh, medical devices for people di with diabetes. So we design, develop, manufacture them. And uh, as Jill mentioned, we've actually placed uh, over 2 million meters into the market at this point uh, throughout the world, U.S., Europe, China, Canada, Australia, Mexico. Uh, and uh, actually going on about a billion and a half test strips. And uh, for those of you unfamiliar with how uh, these products work, uh, so if you have diabetes and you have to test your blood sugar, you will have a handheld uh, device and you'll have a test strip. And you have to prick your finger with a, a lancet or a needle and uh, you get a drop of blood, uh, you put it onto the, the test strip, which is a, a biosensor, and then the, the hardware will actually read, uh, an electrochemical reaction happens, meter gives you your number, and then you know what your blood sugar is. And so um, that's the type of devices uh, that, we, that we make. Um, and when uh, we started off, we went into the diabetes space because uh, it's just such a huge market. I mean, at this point, it's well over $10, $11 billion a year. I mean, I think the statistic is about 20% of all healthcare dollars in the U.S. is spent on diabetes or diabetes-related complications. So it's just a really, really big market. And um, how it was started off was we actually had a technology uh, that enabled uh, twice the accuracy at half the cost. And um, this is important for people that are um, testing themselves very regularly and giving themselves insulin. Because, uh, you know, for, for example, uh, if you were weighing yourself on a scale and, uh, I don't know, you were 100 pounds, and the scale could basically say anywhere from 80 pounds to 120 pounds, you may not be as happy with that, especially if it gave you, uh, you know, 120 and you were 100. You don't think you're, you actually think you've gained weight. Um, and so that's actually how it is in the glucose monitoring space, where you actually only have to be uh, within 20% of what the actual value is. And so that's actually really important in this space, because if you're giving yourself insulin and you get a number that's too high, then you could actually give yourself too much insulin and go into hypoglyce hypoglycemia and actually have really uh, large problems with that. Um, and so it's really, really important to give yourself, uh, to give the user an accurate number. Um, and so a few years ago, kind of like a lot of the folks in this room, you know, we see a lot of value in the connected health space. And so we actually embarked on uh, developing a, an app and a product. Uh, and actually, this is the product here. But this is uh, the first uh, FDA clear glucose meter that works with an iPhone. And uh, it actually just got launched a couple of weeks ago. And Joe will talk more about this. Uh, and it's in a bunch of stores now. And uh, we also, you know, just like everybody here, I think, we see a lot of value in the data that's being collected and sharing it with all the stakeholders in the healthcare system uh, to, enable, uh, to enable better care. 
And if we can just leave you with one message out of all of that is that the two founders of the company, Sonny Boo and Dr. Sridhar Iyengar, are real geniuses. And they came up with this idea that we're going to make a technology company that focuses on diabetes, not a diabetes company that was trying to bolt on technology. And it seems like a, a small distinction, but what's really important there is that we weren't tied to any of the orthodoxies. And so when they were first starting the company, the idea was to sell chips and strips and to become a company sort of like Intel where we had an ingredient brand. So that accuracy that Stuart was talking about could be sort of licensed to anybody who wanted to put it into their meter. But as we went through the market, we found that that didn't work out. And so then the next thought was, well, why not make a generic meter? And then that way you don't have to worry about making test strips. You just make a glucose meter and you can make everybody's test strip better. But that also didn't really make sense commercially and it wasn't what the market wanted. So ultimately what they did was just bite the bullet and say, okay, we'll make glucose meters, we'll make test strips and we'll sell an entire system. And so it was one of these things where they didn't go into it saying, we're going to build the best product in this category. They said, we're the best technologists in this category. Let's see what we can make. And that continues to the present day. I mean, after about five years of selling traditional blood glucose monitoring systems, the thought was, uh, we need more than just a number. An accurate number is a great start, but it's only the start of really healthy and helpful treatment. And so that was what sort of spurred us into moving into M Health. And creating this device that Stuart just mentioned where we can now actually collect a person's blood glucose result, but we can also give them real-time context and an understanding of what that result means in relation to all of their other results. And we can immediately help them share that with their doctor, their EMR, their family, or whoever else might care about it. The other thing that was really good about that approach where it was a technology company focusing on diabetes was it gave us a certain level of humility when developing the products and thinking about how to market them. I think one of the things that a lot of the companies in the M Health space tend to do is focus and get really religious about their brand and want to make their brand front and center. And it's, it's an understandable impulse, but it also turns you off some, from some pretty impressive commercial opportunities. So for instance, from the very early days of the company, we've been private labeling our products. So if you go to a Kroger store, you can buy their products, and they're the number one grocery chain in the country, and they're the number two retailer overall, and they're pushing our products because our products have their logos on them. And as a designer, I love to work with Target. I mean, there's nobody who does better design in the mass merchandise category. I mean, they, have, they make teapots beautiful, and they made an amazing prescription bottle, and they do stuff that nobody else thinks about. So we love that our product is the up-and-up brand glucose meter, but we also have a partner called Liberty Medical. So if you've ever seen Wilford Brimley on daytime TV talking about diabetes and getting diabetes supplies delivered to your house, that's our product. And so it's not the sexiest of markets, but it helped us grow the business without having to take a lot of outside dilutive funding. And it let us fund things like the iPhone project. And it's not just retailers that we partner with. We partnered with Sanofi Aventis. They're the number one pharma company in the world. And with our partnership with them, we now have our products and our technology available to patients at about 20,000 retail locations nationwide. Again, very few people know the name Agamatrix or know the name WaveSense, which is what our technology is called, but they use our product. And the thing that we're really excited about, especially from a design perspective, is we're one of the very few companies that Apple has actually taken into their retail stores from the medical space. So there's a blood pressure cuff, a scale, but we are the only product in the Apple store that uses blood as a user interface. So we're very excited about that. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about selling, uh, selling into the medical space versus the selling into the traditional mobile space. And I think some of these things, items have been touched upon over the last day or so. But you know, if you're making, and let's say you're making a, an app, uh, it's for the pretty clear path to selling to consumers. So you're going to develop the app, you're going to put it in the app store, and then you're going to sell it to consumers. And so you might have a piece of hardware that goes with the app, and maybe that's where you make your money. That's the, you know, the, the revenue. Or maybe you sell services on top of that but you're largely trying to convince the consumer that they, they should use your widget and, and they're willing to pay for it. It's a very clear path. And so um, when you go to the medical space, it gets a lot more complicated. And so um, you have to make the product at the top, so just like, every, just like any space, but you have, all, you have about four or five key stakeholders that really all have different competing interests. Uh, you, have to, you have the doctor who you know, largely just cares that the, that the device or, or the product that the patient's going to use will be safe and effective in, in treating their, whatever condition they have. Um, then you have the insurance company uh, on the left there that has to pay for it because by and large, you know, as I think was hit on a bunch of times, I mean, patients are just not in the U.S. not used to paying for, um, for their supplies and for, 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 uh, they're used to having insurance. Then you have the, the retailers. 
And so the retailers uh, are great because that people can get the products, uh, and so they can go into one of 20,000 pharmacies and, and get them. But the pharmacy, the retailers really care about getting getting foot traffic, getting people into the stores. And so they probably care less about the you know the benefits of, of the device itself, and they just want to get people into the stores. Uh, and then if you're going to go down the Apple, Apple route and actually have an app on the App Store, you need to convince Apple that you're not going to kill somebody with your product and that it's really safe. Um, and, and then the last but not least, you have to convince the consumer that it is something that they're going to want to, to use over the other technologies in the market. Um, and so it's, it's a very complex system. And just to, you know, to give a concrete example, if you look on the left side, you have the, you know, the insurance and the retailer, and it's kind of like the chicken, chicken and the egg. Because if you go to an, typically you go to to an insurance plan, and they'll say, okay, maybe maybe we'll cover this, we'll we'll pay for it, but how can patients get it? And then you go say, okay, well, I'll go to the retailer, and you go to the retailer, and you say, okay, well, uh, will you put it on your shelves? It's a great product, you know, first in its category, and they say, okay, well, uh, can will insurance pay for it? And so it's really a chicken a chicken and the egg thing, and it's uh, not a very uh, easy thing to navigate. Right, and Stuart is exactly right, and this is something we've learned. I mean, we've tried to sell directly to patients. We've worked with retailers, we've worked with insurance companies, we've worked with pharma companies, and what we found is that there's a very big gap between what a patient will pay for and what a, uh, an institution will pay for. And so it's really important, especially, I think, for digital health companies to understand which part of the market that they're gonna go after and then optimize their offering for that. I think the analyst from Frost and Sullivan yesterday was mentioning that people won't pay a penny for test strips, but they'll buy a treadmill. And we found that's generally true. Patients will pay for health care. They'll pay for things that make them look better or, or work out harder. And medical institutions will pay for things that are medicine with a capital M and a red cross next to it. And I think hardware is one of those things, sort of like treadmills and, and glucose meters. Software is another area. I think the market for that is relatively small on the consumer facing side. I mean, it's 99 cents is kind of the upper echelon. And on the insurance side, we've not even seen a lot of reimbursement for that yet. In terms of services, if you fall and you can't get up or if you're trying to get liposuction, people will absolutely pay for that if it's aesthetic or life saving, but not necessarily for anything that's just going to monitor their blood pressure. I mean, they expect that stuff to kind of come for free. And basically what we found, if one side is attracted to it, the other side won't pay for it. And so it creates some interesting dynamics for people who are trying to build businesses and serving either of those patient bases. Um, one of my favorite quotes about the insurance industry is that they have more pilots than the Navy, but very few of them ever get off the ground. And so this is something that we've um, had a lot, of, a lot of challenges with. I mean, insurance companies are big and complex and they provided a very valuable service. And if you can become one of their favorite partners, it's a very great market and a gr very great set of partners to work with. The challenge though is even if you get onto their formularies, there are tiers of formularies and it's a complex world. I think in the, the Rock Health demo days yesterday, the uh, MedMonk team I think is really seeing how this industry is shaping up and all of the copay assistance programs that are really needed now. I mean, you see even companies that are massive pharma companies on low tiers of formulary insurance and so they have to do copay buy down programs and all sorts of uh, complicated maneuvers to get their products cleared. But there are other more easy ways for small companies especially. I mean, we're a relatively small and a relatively new company, and we found that Medicare and Medicaid are both insurance populations, but they're very easy to get on. I mean, basically, once you have an FDA-cleared product and you have a sales force that can introduce it to people, that becomes a vector and a venue that you can take your products to. So that's been extraordinarily lucrative for us, and I'd urge anybody who's doing medical devices to think about how you can strip cost out and make it attractive to those populations. The other thing to look at are captive populations. So we have a huge uh, amount of business in assisted living and long-term care centers, as well as prisons. So these are places where you have lots of strip utilization in our industry and lots of utilization overall, and they're very, um, very solid bases. Got that? So by a show of hands, how many of you work with retailers at all or sell your products at retail? Okay, so just a few. So I'm sure you sort of know about planograms and how important they are. But basically, if you go to a retailer with your product, your widget, your app, or whatever, and you say, I want to get shelf space, um, you're going to have to talk to a category manager or a buyer. And basically, they have complete dominion over a 10-foot linear spa uh, span of shelving or something thereabouts. This is a planogram up on the slide here. And this is the tool they use to decide what every inch of that shelf is going to contain. So this one is for alcohol, but it's the same basic principle for medical products. And you bring your widget to them and you have to say, okay, well, I want you to take one of these products off the shelf and put mine on. And that's a pretty tall order for a number of reasons. 
For one, they've already got a known quantity. They know how much money that square foot of shelf space is generating for them. So they can use that and then they can make a measurement against your product. So you have to convince them that it makes sense. You also have to get your timing just right. I mean, one of the things that we always think is funny in the digital space is people complain about how it takes two whole weeks to get an app cleared in the Apple App Store and they wish it could get down to just a week. When you're dealing with retailers, the, the average time that these are gonna change, these planograms will change is if you're lucky once a quarter and more realistically, once or twice a year. So you could come up with a product and if you just happen to come up with it and get your FDA clearance one month too late, you could be locked out of retail for an entire year or at least one retailer shelf for an entire year. So it's a pretty huge challenge. And then there are just all of the personal dynamics. So we've seen a lot that you'll have a buyer at a retailer who is gonna stick with a certain product because they like playing golf with the rep that sells that product. So retail's complex, it's very exciting, and it's a great way to get products in your people's hands, but you have to bring a lot to the table as well. And one of the things you have to think about are how you're gonna help pull products off the shelf. So if you talk to a retailer, the first thing they're gonna ask you is, what's your marketing budget? How much are you gonna spend on TV commercials, on radio, on doctor detailing to pull the product off the shelf? I mean, they view themselves as a place to keep the product, but you have to bring the customers to them. And in the digital health space, a lot of people say, oh, well, I've got a million Facebook fans, or I've got 100,000 Twitter followers, or I've got you know, the world's best social media campaign that's gonna redefine pharmaceutical marketing. And there are a lot of companies that are trying to just focus on this as a, a new area where they are trying to help companies optimize this. But what we find is that that doesn't necessarily resonate. I know the CMO of a company that has 70 million views on YouTube. They have 10,000 plus hours a year of people watching their videos that are actually measured and uh, metrics via Google Analytics. And the retail buyers say, okay, well that's great, you've got 10,000 hours, but how many commercials are you gonna run? So they don't necessarily value it, but the one thing that they do value is BOGO. Do any of you know what BOGO means? Just show your hands if you do. Okay, a few of you. It's buy one, get one free, it's not a new website. And so basically coupons are like Google Analytics for retailers. This is still what is moving the needle and what's driving um, trial at stores. So if you don't have a, a barcode that they can scan and see that people are actually taking the product off your shelf, you're basically invisible. So it's a, it's a challenging world and a difficult one to navigate, but if you can figure it out, you've got you know, potentially hundreds of millions of people seeing your product every week. Okay, so the uh, so this, the second part uh, of our talk is we want to talk about some of the some of the gatekeepers perhaps that could prevent uh, prevent you from from playing in the space or in the regulated regulated environment. So the FDA is one. Apple could be another, and there just could be other things to think about um, that you have to consider. So you know, Joe and I were thinking about this before we, we came to San Diego, and so we, we kind of the kind of we encapsulated it into one statement, which might seem obvious, but it's I think the mentality needs to be more that you need to develop medical products that are mobile, not mobile products that are medical. And so, um, and I think this theme has sort of been hit on a couple of times uh, in the last uh, couple of days. Um, the uh, I think one of the, uh, the the Rock Health folks was saying, you know, uh, looking at thinking about being a medical company early on is very very important, very valuable. You know, dealing with uh, thinking planning for dealing with the FDA early on, not late in the game, is very very important. And so we, we very much agree with that. Um, so even you know even something as simple as designing your company for regulation, uh, it seems you know it's just very different. So a traditional app startup, you might have a, a CEO, kind of the visionary who who has the idea. And you have a, a soft, couple of software developers, maybe a marketing intern, or, you know, they're doing doubling as the business development person, and that's it. Um, you know, for example, we know we're good friends with a company, and they have a, they have a CEO, one developer, one intern, and a business development person, and they have six million active users of their app. Really, really impressive. Not regulated. And so then if you look at a more of a traditional medical device startup, you just have a lot more, a lot more things to consider. So of course you have your development and you have your, your R&D, which you're going to need, but you also have to think about things like quality and like uh, regulatory, uh, which you wouldn't have to do if you didn't weren't regulated. And so, uh, for example, by show of hands, does anybody know what the term 483 means? It's not an area code. I actually looked this up last night. It's actually not a signed area code. But 483 is actually a warning letter from the FDA. And, um, and so uh, you have to have somebody in your organization that could, could deal with that if the FDA sends it to you. Or you know, there's a standard for medical devices. So the, the term is ISO 15197. 
You know, you may not have to know yourself, but you should have somebody on your team that knows about it. And so, you know, maybe you don't have to have something as complex as this, but it's definitely, you have to have sort of core team members that are able to uh, span this, this breadth of information that you have, to, you have to have to play in the regulated space. Very different than if you're just, uh, if you're just developing an app that's not regulated. Um, so kind of explaining the FDA, we, what we, Joe and I thought about was we, we should have kind of brought it down to kind of four key things. And um, it's funny, and I, I think coming from the space, I'm a little bit, uh, I get used to thinking about things like this. I was actually uh, giving an interview a couple of weeks ago, and I really had to, ex I really, it kind of forced me to explain this to, a, to a, a reporter that's very, very knowledgeable, does all sorts of stories all the time, and it was still uh, a lot to explain to him. Well, what's the difference? You're, you're doing something for the FDA. What's the big deal? It should be something, it shouldn't be that hard. And, you know, granted it's not, but it just, there's a lot more infrastructure you have to build. So uh, I think a bunch of folks over the last couple of days hit on, you know, having a quality system. And so really what a quality system is, it's just a set of documents that describe how you develop products and another set of documents that, that says that you follow them. I mean, that's kind of at its core what it is. And so that's, that's pretty straightforward. But how this plays a part in developing products that are going to be regulated um, is, is actually bef before the product is launched, kind of in the, in the product development process. So if you're developing an app, let's say, and that's not regulated, uh, you're probably going to go to the whiteboard and you know, a couple of folks are going to map out the UI, uh, list out the features, and literally you'll have a, a first version coded up probably within a couple of days, if not sooner. You're going to see it, play with it, say, oh, I actually want to make these changes to it, uh, fix a couple of bugs. You're going to give it out to a bunch of people in the public domain. They're going to test it. Uh, and you're going to get it back. And this is all going to happen very, very quickly. And then you're going to launch it. Hell, you, might, you may not even have written down what's on the whiteboard. You might have actually just, just erased it, and you don't have to think about it again. And that's how kind of traditional, maybe a regular app will be developed. When you're developing a, a product that's going to be regulated, you actually have to define very, very clearly what specifications are in the product. Uh, you then have to think about what risks are involved. So, the, I mean, the FDA and, and agencies love thinking about risk because they say, okay, well, if it's something that's going to be medical, I want to know what the risk to the patient is. And then you have to think about, think and document, well, how do you mitigate that risk? Uh, what things are you doing to actually document that you've thought about it? Uh, and then you have to do more rigorous testing, which kind of comes to the, to the right-hand column. Uh, so when you, when you test a medical product, you have to go through very rigorous testing to make sure the product you're putting out there is safe and effective, as it should be, because you know, people are relying on your products to manage their health on a day-by-day -day basis. So it should be safe and reliable. And so there's just a lot more testing that's involved, which you also have to document that you've done it, to prove that you've done it. Um, one of the other things is customer feedback, which I think sometimes people don't think about. But um, so you actually, have, I mean, the FDA requires you to have uh, to be able to take in customer feedback. Um, from our experience, luckily, we've actually had a really good track record with this. And so most of the phone calls that we get uh, are people wanting to know how to use it, or they, they don't know which end of the strip to put into the meter, uh, or things like that, or they want to know where to buy it. So you know that's probably 95% of all of our, our of our calls. However, the FDA does actually require you to be able to do this because if the user would call and say, "I just had lunch and I'm getting a reading on my meter of 25 or something like that," and they're actually and, and maybe there's something wrong with the product, then you actually are required by law to report that to to the FDA, and so they actually make you do this. And actually, you have to you have to report it within I don't know I think it's 24 48 hours something like that. And so it's, it's really uh, important to do that. And then verification, um, you actually have a company come once a year, or, or the FDA could come pretty much whenever they want to, and they actually will just verify that you're doing this entire loop. Um, and so the, the difference between a, 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 in the regulated space and not is if, let's say, you submitted an app to Apple and it was on the App Store and you had a lot of bad reviews, there was a lot, it was a lot of bugs in it, um, Apple would just pull it off. They might be also frustrated with you, but they would just pull it off. Whereas if you're in the regulated space and you actually are not following your, your, your processes, the FDA could put a, pad, put a padlock on your door and arrest the uh, senior executives of the company. So uh, it's kind of a, a quite a stark difference between, uh, between the two environments. Uh, and so this, we, were just, we were thinking about it, and I think the difference is, and a lot of people have hit on this last couple of days, is that you know, being in the regulated space is, is, on one hand, kind of seems a little bit daunting, but on the other hand, it actually is, is not that bad once you kind of get, get the hang of it. 
And it actually can create a competitive advantage for you uh, if you have that knowledge, if you have that knowledge in your company. And so actually the, the, the bigger gap is between not being regulated and being regulated. I think that's kind of the biggest gap because you have this disconnect between all the infrastructure elements we just mentioned. But if you're a class one or a class two or a class three, you know, by and large, you have a lot of infrastructure already. And so maybe you require more testing for a class three, a defibrillator or something like that, uh, more than you would a, a class one, a, a blood pressure meter. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you still have the infrastructure set up. And so, um, you know, you can kind of fall and you can deal with whatever class uh, product that you're actually going to develop. Right. And the idea of being regulated scares, I think, a lot of companies off. They think it's going to be a lot of burden and a lot of extra work, and it's going to be a sort of a drag on their development process. And in many ways, that's true. But it also creates a, a sense and it institutionalizes rigorous thinking. So in our space, we made this glucose meter that attaches to the iPhone. And we're very proud of it. It's FDA cleared. And we've already got some competitors, people who made similar kinds of products. But because they weren't used to the rigors of dealing with the FDA, they didn't necessarily consider the human factors. So we're huge Apple fanboys at Augamatrix and fangirls. And when we were developing our iPhone product, we knew a lot about it. And when we were doing this risk analysis, we said, look, the only risk isn't just related to having a low result that looks, looks fine for some weird reason or things that were purely medical. We said, look, our iPhone batteries are horrible. I mean, the things die out and they don't last a full day, especially if they're a couple years old. And so we can't make a device where if your iPhone battery dies because you were listening to too many songs, that you can't do a test that could potentially mean life or death. So from the very beginning, we said, okay, that's a risk. And we looked and we cataloged all of these risks and we built our device this way. And you see, it's not attached to the iPhone, but it still has a screen. It still has a strip port connector. So you can still do a test and get a number. It's got a memory. So you can share all of those results with your iPhone later on. And it's got a battery. So you can use it for a week, basically, without having to plug it back into the iPhone. So that way, you'll never be in a situation where you need to figure out how much insulin to take and you can't do the calculation because your phone is dead. And the competitors that we have in this industry already don't sell in the US because they didn't consider that. They said, oh, we're going to make a cool, small looking thing that's really neat and pretty, but it wouldn't work as a standalone device. And hence, people don't want it. So it can actually make you really think and deliver better products. And that's what these systems are designed to do, to make better products and to have healthier and safer patients. The other thing that having the institutional bias and these processes in place from the very early days of your company and why that's important is because it's going to help you select and evaluate platforms. So, you know, we always tell or we always get this question, we say, oh, we have this really awesome phone or product for the iPhone. And people say, oh, well, do you have it for Android as well? And unfortunately, right now we have to say no. And it's not because we don't think Android's valuable. We know how many people have them. We know how many people are getting them every day. I think it's 900,000 activations a day. But when we were looking at the platforms, Apple and their iOS platform just made so much more sense. For one thing, they've got this program called MFI, which stands for Made for iPhone. So it's a series of protocols and processes and procedures that you can use to make products for their, um, for their products. And it's, it's very important because you need to develop these products and you need to know that the data that you're sending from your device is making it effectively into their device. And it's much easier when you've got a very clear and documented tool set from the manufacturer. It's also the biggest market. And I think you hear all of these stories, especially in the tech press, where Android's eating Apple's lunch and that there are more Android phones being activated every day than iOS uh, phones. But that's only one part of the battle. I mean, you also have to consider the iPad and the iPod Touch. In our case, we have a huge population that is type 1 diabetic or, juvenile di or has juvenile diabetes. And so parents aren't necessarily going to buy a $600 phone with a $100 data plan to use our device, but they will buy an iPod Touch. And there's no equivalent to that, really, on the Android platform. And then the last thing, just getting back to what Stuart was talking about with testing, is uh, these last three bullet points. Basically, there are hundreds of different Android phones. There are about a dozen when you count all the iPads and iPhones and iPod Touches, but a dozen models. So a dozen versus 100, and you'd have to test on some section of each of those. But each one of those Android phones is a little bit different because the operating system's different based on the hardware manufacturer. The skins are different. The, the core parts of it are different. And those have even more tweaks based on what carrier they're at. So an Android phone that's running a, a flavor of the operating system that, say, say an HTC device running on AT&T, our device might behave differently on one that's a, um, a Samsung device running on T-Mobile. The other thing is you have to consider that these things have life cycles and that there are always new versions of operating systems coming out, and you have to be future-proof. And so there are, um, there are versions of phones, uh, Android phones, that were sold on January 1st this year 
that are not going to be able to use the new operating system that Google releases at the end of this year. So within the space of a year, these phones become obsolete and they're no longer usable. Whereas with iPhone, Apple just announced iOS 6, and it runs on every product they've produced for the last three years. And so that makes it much easier and much more attractive for us to develop on iOS versus Android. And one of the things that's very important when you're considering the FDA is they don't like the idea of radical transformation or paradigm shift or any of the words that we typically use when we talk about what digital health will do to healthcare. Uh, what they like to hear is, you've got something that's substantially equivalent to an existing product. And that's what a 510K is. That's the main way you're going to get a, an FDA-cleared product by saying, I have a device, I have a widget, I have an app, I have a whatever, and it is substantially equivalent to this one that I can point to. So something that came out last year or last month. And when we went to the Apple, we didn't say, look, we've come up with a breakthrough, the first major breakthrough in glucose monitoring technology for 20 years. We said, look, you already approve software that runs on computers. Up in the top left there, Apple, PC, whatever. And you've approved software that we've made for a computer. We have a download software for our meters called ZeroClick, and we've had it for about five years. And we have glucose meters. And so basically we just said, look, the phone is the computer. The test strips on our old meter are basically the same as the test strips on the new meter. The cable that we used to use to download and connect the meter and the computer, that's the 30-pin connector on the Apple device. And the CD that we used to have, that's the App Store. And so it's actually even better because if there's ever a problem or if we ever need to tweak something, we can pull our app off the App Store and it's much easier than trying to pull things off a product shelf. So it's a, a very attractive thing to go to the FDA and just say, look, this is, this is substantially equivalent. You say that to the FDA and then when you talk about it to consumers, you can talk about how life-changing it is. But separating the technology from the marketing is pretty important. And then the last thing to think about, and this is really important with, I think, designers, and especially digital designers. That was my background. And you know, you're used to pushing code out every day, or maybe once a week, or if you're in a really slow environment, once a month. That company that Stuart was talking about that has 6 million users, we asked, well, how do you test your code? And they said, oh, well, we deploy it. And if it breaks, they just deploy it again, and they've got a new version. And you know, we hear frustration from people when they say, oh, it takes two weeks to get my app cleared, just like it does with retailers. And what we tell them and what we try to caution everybody to is that when you're dealing with medical devices, especially hardware-based medical devices, you really need to reframe your thinking to be more like presidential elections or Olympic seasons. I mean, you're going to be working on two, three, four-year timelines. And it's kind of funny, you know, when, when we were designing our, our product here, our little glucose meter with the app, we finished the user interface, the bulk of the design and all of the wireframes, the day that John McCain announced Sarah Palin as his vice presidential running mate. So, and, it, and it just launched, I think, last month. So that gives you a scale for how long these things take. And you know, if, you know, when people ask me, is there a difference between developing for mobile and developing for medical, I always say, you betcha. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the, the last thing we want to talk about as well is just, thing you, as Joe just mentioned, talking, thinking about some of these timelines is as you look beyond the United States, beyond the US market, uh, other, other countries you have to consider uh, the time it takes to get products approved. Um, so just uh, to pick a couple of countries, for example, let's take the, the US and Germany and China. Just by a show of hands, so who thinks, it's the, who thinks that it has the shortest regulatory cycle is the US? So nobody? Germany? Anybody for Germany? China? China? More hands for China? Okay, so, so it just, you know, I wanted to kind of get a poll for people. So if we go to, the, go to the next slide, actually Germany is the shortest. So all of Europe is actually, uh, is actually the shortest. Uh, and so a lot of the regulations in Europe are, are a lot more focused on the, the company itself. So they kind of, it's more like you're innocent until proven guilty. So it's a, lot of the, a lot of the regulation in Europe is, okay, well, if you're a company that develops products according to a regulated process, and you sign a piece of paper that says you develop this new product according to that process, we're going to trust that, that it's safe and effective. And so it's, you actually will oftentimes see products launched in, the, in Europe uh, prior to the US uh, because of this. And so actually, just as an anecdote, on our particular space with glucose monitoring, you oddly will see products that are typically launched first in the Netherlands. Um, I think mainly because it's quick to approve. Uh, it's actually, they can get, the re reimbursement is really good in the Netherlands, and that uh, it's a relatively small country, you know, compared to Germany or some of the other ones. So if you had a problem, if your initial launch, it would be a pretty small market. And so it's just odd. That's how we usually get all the, all the new products. We get them from the Netherlands. Uh, so the next is the U.S. And so as kind of Joe mentioned, the 510K process, it's a 90-day process. And so it actually could be shorter than that if they get back to you sooner. But by and large, the way to think about it is it's, it's about three months. 
So the, uh, the next one is actually China. So for those that thought China was the fastest, it's actually one of the longest. Uh, and uh, it actually takes a, over a year, probably closer to a year and a half, to get products approved in China. Uh, actually, about four or five years ago, um, they went on, underwent a lot of reform in China, and they actually executed the head of the, uh, F of the China FDA organizations. <laughs> they take it pretty seriously over there. Um, and Japan is even longer. And so Japan is probably a year and a half, two years, to even get a product clear that you know, is pretty similar to other products on the market today. Uh, and so it's just, you know, I just, I think it's important to think about, you know, as you look beyond the U.S. market, there's a lot of challenges like this out there in really, really big and lucrative markets that you're going to have to consider, um, which are maybe you wouldn't anticipate. You would think, okay, well, a product in China or Japan it should be quicker. It's not. It takes quite a, quite a long time. And so kind of the, the last thing we wanted just to kind of leave everybody with was, you know, as you're thinking about, uh, you know, developing products or apps for, for the regulated space, it's, it's a bit different um, than, than the non-regulated space. So let's say you're Zynga and you're, and you're, you know, coming out with a new version of Words with Friends and you have a bug uh, that, that makes you lose your game and you shouldn't have. Well, you lose a game. I mean, I play it, so I, I definitely know how frustrating that would be, but you lose a game. So it's not the end of the world. Uh, whereas, let's say you have a fitness app or, or a health app that actually is tracking how much you're eating or how many carbohydrates you're taking. And let's say you, uh, you know, make a mistake in developing that app and, I don't know, the user will gain a pound by accident from, from using this app. Not the end of the world. But in the regulated space, I mean, you know, you could have somebody die. And so I think, you know, it sounds kind of ominous, but I also think it's a really good, uh, it's, a, it's a really great opportunity and a really big responsibility that people have when they're developing products for the regulated space. Uh, because you really have to be, be careful uh, and you're developing products that people are going to use every day to manage their health. So on the one hand, I definitely think it's a lot more to consider than the non-regulated space, but it's also a really, really great opportunity and responsibility that we have. All right. I think that's it. Uh, any questions or? Thoughts? Uh, the Apple model seems to be a very convergent, where everything converges into one phone. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think of guys like Green Goose? Uh, I mean, I think Green Goose is a pretty amazing platform. The idea of being able to put sensor, I think, you know, with their original vision, being able to put sensors on everything and to create different sensor tracks, whether it's brushing your teeth or washing your dog or every time you open a, a fridge door or something like that, I think it's got a, a lot of possibility. It seems like the challenge and the opportunity there is creating an ecosystem of developers and for them to develop products themselves that get beyond the toothbrushing. I think that's a really great first demo product, but, you know, if they can make those things inexpensive enough and if they can make them um, sort of understandable enough, it could be a pretty awesome tool for behavior change. I have uh, two questions. One is, can you talk about the process of getting your product into the Apple Store? And two, what is your approach for the changing uh, handset for the iPhone as it evolves over time, just hardware-wise? Well, I'll touch on the second one first. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, that's something that everybody. The rumor mill is that you know they're going to be changing a lot of the hardware platform, and so we're already thinking about that because I think that um, you, you see it now. The writing's on the wall that I think they'll probably make some changes to the hardware, and so it's one of the other challenges that we didn't hit on here, but it's a really good point that we have to adapt to that. Um, as there are major changes like that that happen, even in Apple's ecosystem, uh, we, have to do, we have to be thinking about that so that we're actually making a product that will connect to those new phones. I think the one thing to add to that, though, is that Apple is a really, I think, spectacular partner just because they have really good product sense. I mean, we developed our product here, this little thing, and if you take a look at it up close, and I'll happily show it to you afterwards, we designed the, the shell for this around the 3G and the 3GS style phone. And basically, we had the, the parts back from the manufacturer for about two weeks, and then Apple announced this, which was a completely different industrial design, hard-edged and you know, equally beautiful, but very different. And so basically, you just have to be prepared and be ready to scramble to make a new case that connects them and all of that. But the nice thing is, even though they changed the aesthetics, it still fits in pretty perfectly, and it still works. Whereas with an Android device, I mean, they might change the shell from being, you know, the nice thing is Apple, every 30-pin connector is on the bottom device centered in the middle of it. Whereas with Android, you might say, OK, well, I had it down here before, and I have to plug it into the side or into the back or something. So there's that. Uh, in terms of getting into the Apple Store, I think it's, it's a bit of a mystery to anybody who's even in the Apple Store. I think 
the only thing you can really do is just make an excellent product and, and try to do something that's unique and different. I mean, I think they're always incented to show off what their platform can do. So I think you know, we have a medical device in there, but they just launched a new product called the iGrill to measure uh, meat temperatures on your grill remotely. So they're open to a lot of ideas as long as it's new and interesting.